This is going to be one heck of a project. Let me present to you the quad bunk bed room thing. With some of the best push to open drawers on the market, three twin beds and one queen, for the dog of course, some built-in shelves, a stairway to heaven, and some sturdy railings to make sure all hands and feet stay inside the vehicle at all times. So buckle up, because welcome to Fortress Fine Woodworks. The wood we are gonna use is poplar for better economics, and we found a true behemoth of a board if I do say so myself, and she goods will also be used for various panels. The first components to be made are the support slash decorative panels that are basically the bread and butter of this entire project. We need to make these first so that other components can attach to them. So to start, I'm cutting eight quarter or 50 millimeter stock to form the frames of the panels. I found that when cutting rough edge lumber on the miter saw, it's best to chop down at the end of the cut, then slide forward and finish off the cut to reduce binding. Then Cody can put one straight edge on them so we can rip them into rough strips. I'm grateful to have a seven horsepower saw to power its way through this thick wood. And if you don't, just raise the blade halfway and do it in two passes instead. A dedicated ripping blade is also helpful if your saw lacks power. Now the individual boards can be put through the various milling steps. And while Cody does that, I might as well start cutting the three quarter sheets to rough sizes. This is three quarter or 18 millimeter birch veneered plywood. Now they can be refined on the table saw, but we are still leaving them a touch oversized and I'll explain why. Two of these plywood panels are going to be glued together to make a thick inch and a half or 38 millimeter panel. And we want the warping of each panel to be opposing its partner. That way we end up with a stable and flat product. And since it would be hard to align these perfectly during glue up, we left them an inch oversized so that they can be cut down later. Again, with the arcs opposing each other, we can glue them together and add some brad nails here and there for clamps. Just make sure to keep the brads away from the edge where we will be cutting soon. Now that we can measure the actual thickness of the finished panel, we can work our way closer to that thickness with the boards we milled. With a few passes later, we can confirm that we didn't overshoot and make them too thin. So now we have the large bottom panels made to rough size and the frame wood thickness to the correct dimension. Next, we need to cut the inset panels to size and finish dimensioning everything else. The inset panels are half inch or 12 millimeter MDF and are cut in the same manner as before. Meanwhile, Cody is finalizing the frame wood and I can clean up the edges of these thick guys. Everything is going to be held together with splines, so half inch dados need to be cut into the edges of the frame and thick panel. I also realize that I should probably check to make sure I'm at the correct final width before I continue. And I am, so I can cut the top rail to match the width of the lower panel. The rest of the frame components can also be cut to length. Notice that the two middle styles have grooves cut in both sides for the inset panels. The lower panel also needs to be grooved, as well as the ends of the middle styles. I'm using a push block to make sure my pieces stay square and supported through the cut. For the upper rail though, I want the spline to be much deeper, more like an actual tenon. The upper rail needs to be incorporated in a very strong way because it takes a lot of the weight from the upper bed. The outer styles also need that deep groove to accept the large tenon, just in that location though. You can see I stopped my deeper cut about six inches down. Now the splines can be made from some of the off cuts. We are going for a very snug fit so that everything is nice and strong in the end. And notice the way the grain is running. We want the grain to be perpendicular to the joint. 
For the sake of showing you how everything fits together, I'm doing a dry run so I can get all of the different camera angles and so you know exactly what's going on. The splines can be added together down the line until we have a nice long tenon that can be slipped into the mating style. Notice how I gave a smidge of gap room within the joint to make sure we can get everything nice and tight once there's glue. Here's where it gets clever. The inset panels are planned to be the same thickness as the splines. That way, a simple small spline can be added after the panel and a middle style can be popped on. No fuss, no muss. And in theory, you could cut the splines out of that same MDF, but it wouldn't be quite as strong as actual wood. The top rail gets its deep floating tenon, making sure that the grain is running in the strong orientation. Now the top rail can be joined on, followed by the final style, which I'm thankful I'm doing this dry fit because I'm realizing how tight everything is when it's such a long joint like this. So you'll see in a future clip that we will taper one edge of the splines to make assembly a lot easier. With everything back apart, we can final sand the inset panels and inside edges of the frame. I also taper the edges of the groove to clean up any jagged or splintery corners. And here it is, tapering one edge of each spline like I said. Looks like it's go time. I do suggest having someone help you with this glue up or at least using an extended wood glue because there's a lot of pieces to join together and the last thing you want is to get halfway through and realize your glue is setting up. Just saying. We've basically already been through this part but there's a few tips that I just couldn't sleep at night if I didn't share with you. The first tip is to utilize rollers and brushes to apply glue fast. The second is, make sure you remember to clean up all of the inside edges of every part so your OCD doesn't tell you to rip everything apart again to sand a few spots. It's obviously not from personal experience or anything, it's just food for thought. The third tip is to have a block of wood and rubber mallet ready because some of your joints might be a bit tighter than you first thought. And I don't know about you, but I sure do love moments like this. Oh yeah. The fourth tip is, don't be afraid to pair up a few clamps if you don't own extremely long ones. It seems to be getting the job done for us at least. And the final tip is, clean up squeeze out with a wet microfiber cloth. Just trust me. And there it is. Now that we have three support panels made, we can work on the framing that makes up the lower left twin bed and the lower right queen bed. The twin bed consists of an outer perimeter of plywood panels that create an enclosure, one center divider to separate the two drawers, a back frame, a front frame that serves as a face frame and support for the slats that will go on last, and two inset drawer faces that will be pushed to open rather than having hardware. The queen bed is built in a similar way with false drawer fronts on the long side and pushed open drawers on the short side. The front face frames need special glue up, so we might as well get those started first. I'm starting by ripping different thicknesses of wood into strips. The thicker board will support the bed slats, and the thinner board will serve as the face frame. Cody can work on getting the two pieces glued and pin nailed together. The lower part of the frame gets two pieces of three quarter joined together to stiffen it up. While he makes those, I can start cutting the plywood casing. These are just strips of 3 quarter or 12 millimeter birch plywood ripped to width, then cut to length on the miter saw. Then a cutaway can be cut away back on the table saw. Some of them need pocket holes depending on if they are connecting components. Now we can cut those face frame components to length and switch gears back to the support panels we built before. 
I drill holes in the bottom for adjustable feet, then trim away the exposed tenons at the top so we can do notches. These notches will accommodate the supportive rails that function as the upper bed frame. On one side, the notch is one and three quarters wide, and on the other, it's only one inch wide. And I'll show you so you're not like, what the f Because the backside frame towards the wall needs a one inch wide board as the actual bed support, while the front side needs the same one inch support and a three quarter fascia that hides the plywood. So the front notch needs to be deeper to accept two boards. So there they are, all notched out. Now we can actually begin assembling the structure. The best way to start is with the twin bed. The back enclosure connects the two support panels with pocket hole screws. And Cody doesn't know it, but he's putting the panel with the wrong end forward here. So we are going to proceed putting a million screws in just to have to take them back out again. The side panel gets screwed on and take note that the cutaway is on the bottom front side. This is important. Screws are plenty strong, no glue here. Then I proceed to put the front frame on upside down, thinking I'm brilliant. Then give it a love tap. And then realizing, oh, whoops. I better put this thing on the right way around, huh? Oh, there we go. At this point, I still haven't realized that the panel is backwards. Until now. We can't just flip that one around though because it will have a million screw holes in the show side. So we're just switching it out for the other one. This back frame is added to make the height level with the front frame while adding a wider surface to mount the slats to. You can see that there are adjustable feet on the bottom of the panels. I don't know where the footage went, but just an FYI, everything, and I mean everything, will have adjustable feet. With the bed on its side, we can add the center divider and the bottom face frame can be settled into the notches and screwed in from the bottom. Then more adjustable feet can be added to support the middle portion of the bed since there will be drawers. and back upright, she goes. Now we can work on the upper support rails, which I thought could just be long continuous boards. But then I realized maybe I'm not the smartest, most handsome man in the entire world, because there's no way we are going to be able to get 13 foot boards into a basement bedroom. Duh. So long story short, this 14 footer of a behemoth is figuratively going to waste because it's getting cut down into shorter boards anyways. With one long cut on the miter saw, an elegant flip, and a final cut later, now we have a more manageable board to joint, which you already know that whole process. So let's skip to cutting them to width and installing them. First up is the thicker support rail. This laps the right panel halfway. That way the next rail has something to bear on as well. Some long screws will do just fine at attaching them. We left the wall side extra long. That way it can get cut to final length on install day. The back side can also be installed in the same manner. Now the rightmost decorative panel can be attached using the upper rails. Again, we left these long in case real life measurements differ on install day. I'm just making sure the panel is in the correct location before screwing it on. The outer fascia rail will be attached to the inner rail with screws from the inside. So pre-drilling holes first will help that process. Then I can put a few screws on deck and ready to go. That way I'm not fiddling around with a drill and screws while holding the fascia in place. Just make absolute sure your screws aren't too long. We place the screws about two feet apart. Yeah. 
there's actually one more decorative panel to be made. Since the queen bed is turned 90 degrees and extends past the main support panel quite a ways, we need to add a shoulder panel that the rest of the bed can attach to. This panel is made with the same three-quarter plywood as before, although there will be one main difference. We don't really need to waste two full panels. We can just add strips on the back to make it the proper thickness. In theory, we could have done this to the two support panels that sit against the wall anyways, and I thought about this originally, but for the sake of strength, we did what we did. We don't want plywood edges to be exposed though, so poplar strips serve as edge banding to finish off two of the edges. And of course, I just use a miter where they meet. While the glue is drying on the shoulder panel, we can go ahead and cut the plywood sheets for the upper twin beds. These are also left long so that they can get cut on site depending on the angle and how curvy the walls are. Countersunk screws around the perimeter will be plenty to hold the panels in place. And since there isn't any center support rail, we decided to give it a test run for strength. You can see there is a little bit of flex in the plywood, which is good for a bed, but the rails aren't even moving, so we have plenty of support. Now the second one can go on just the same. And in order to attach the shoulder panel, we decided pocket holes from the backside would be plenty. Then adjustable feet can be added. Then it can be screwed into its counterpart. Now that we have something to mount to, we can finish up fabricating the queen bed frame. We want this thing to be nice and sturdy. For the dog, you weirdo. As I mentioned before, the queen bed has a left frame that has false drawer fronts. This is attached to a corner, which in turn is attached to the face frame for the drawer side. The corner piece is just cut out of a single piece of wood, then pocket hole screwed to some long rails. The wall end has a normal style. Now a plywood panel with a top rail is created, and this will be mounted to the inside of the frame we just made. Then you guessed it, adjustable feet are added. The whole assembly can be put together over by the bunk bed so it can be flipped into place once done. A center divider is still needed because the drawer slides will be attaching to this. And of course, what did you think was going to happen? And since pre-planning pays off, we can gently let the bed frame fall into place. Some screws mount it to both panels as usual. Now the top rail can go in like a glove and a center rail can be made with a cutout. You'll see why in a second. The notch allows for clearance for the drawer enclosure. If I take you in close, you can see I also notched the other side of the rail to bear on the plywood. Then some pocket screws hold it into place, no problem. And there she is. I usually breeze over installing the drawer slides because it's rather straightforward, but the push to open mechanisms on these Blum drawer slides are pretty freaking awesome. So let me show you. These are Blum Movento undermount slides, and I will link them in the description, as well as any related accessories. With an eighth inch shim holding the drawer slide up a bit, I can use their alignment jig to set the correct depth, then pre-drill a hole in the front and in the back. But I only put a screw in the back for now, and I'm using a little wooden jig to hold them at the correct height. The tip-on accessory will serve as the push to open function. It has a clip that latches into the bottom of its mating slide. Then there is a unit that attaches to each slide that will activate the push to open mechanism. These just clip right in. Now following the included instructions, I can cut the rod to length. This will synchronize the two units so if one side of the drawer gets pushed, it activates both sides.
Then everything can be retracted and given a test. But since these drawers are incredibly wide, I'm also adding another accessory called a stabilizer set. This will keep the slides running in sync at all times so that the drawer can't rack and cause problems. For this, there is a rear clip that gets mounted first. It has a gear on the inside that will run along a track. Now the track itself can be threaded through and attached to the underside of the slide on the front and back. The reason why we used a shim in the front of the slide is because the track holds the slide up that amount in the front. And the screw isn't mounted yet so that we can get everything locked in, then pushed back down and finally screwed in. There's also a rod on this accessory that synchronizes both sides. This directly attaches to the gears that run the track, and it's locked in with clips to keep it from detaching. In most cabinets, you won't have enough room for all of the track, so they can be cut to length like I'm showing you here. I don't have the stabilizer sets for the queen bed at this point, so I'll have to add those later, and there it is. And since this project is such a long one, we're gonna have to continue this in the next video. If you gained any value from this creation, please consider subscribing. And I'd like to thank my Patreon members because they make these videos possible. I just sent out their handmade thank you gifts this last week. And if you wanna be one of the first 20 members, you'll get one too. So check it out at Patreon slash Fortress Fine Woodworks. And I'll see you in the next video where we build the stairs, railings, and shelving units. Thanks for watching. You can subscribe by clicking on the left icon, and here's another awesome video to watch.